Let me start just about the sort of things that I work on. Um, so I work primarily in two different areas. Um, the first area is uh, condensed matter uh, strongly correlated systems, things like the high te temperature superconductors and spin liquids, magnetism. And I use uh, DMRG for this and, and both to development and um, um, applications. And then the other uh, area I work on is uh, trying to improve the application of DMRG to electronic structure. So I don't do so much uh, applications there, uh, but sort of look at uh, fundamental problems of, of what's limiting uh, the DMRG application, which also applies to, to tensor networks and potentially other algorithms. Um, what, uh, what the limitations are and how you can set up the Hamiltonian to make the, the simulation better. So um, these two things, in my mind, are very closely linked. And I think Garnett, uh, if you were here for his uh, talk on Monday, I think he gave an ex excellent example and, and, and explanation for why these uh, two different areas are pretty closely linked. And so I'm mostly going to talk about the uh, second area. Um, but um, let me show one slide which uh, shows um, uh, some results from the, the first area and sort of sh show what the issue is. Okay, so this was a paper that we, we completed in the fall. And uh, uh, I hope you've heard about the, the, the Hubbard model, um, sort of the simplest uh, paradigmatic uh, model for uh, understanding strongly correlated electrons on a lattice. And a close cousin of that model is the, the TJ model, where you sort of eliminate the double occupancy of sites in exchange for an exchange term. And um, so DMRG has been slowly improving. And um, so we, the techniques are now good enough that we could work out um, what we think is a pretty accurate phase diagram for this particular um, system. It's the plain TJ model with one extra uh, uh, near, next nearest neighbor hopping term. And, you know, we found um, various uh, sort of phases that so in potential have a direct application to understanding the cuprate high temperature superconductors. Okay, and various sort of interesting things that we, we saw. Then if we try to compare that with the experiments on the cuprates, and so this is an experimental sort of schematic broad phase diagram. Um, Going as a function, the x-axis is doping, the y-axis is temperature, we have antiferromagnetism. The, the left side of zero is electron dope, the right side is hole dope, that's very important. There's both families of, of cuprates. And um, there's evidence of charge order, which we think of as stripes. And um, there's uh, uh, superconducting uh, order on both sides, with it much stronger on the hole dope side. So if we look at what we got from this model, uh, we, we're not trying to do uh, temperature. That's a little bit more difficult. But, but so for instance, look at the big green shape. That's matched by this black curve, or a slightly smaller size is the dash curve. And there's general sort of uh, qualitative agreement. Um, similarly, for the charge order with the red curve, that's, that's fairly similar. But if you look at what we're, we get for the superconductivity, it's just messed up. So the blue curve here is showing that we get nice uh, superconductivity on the electron dope side, but there it's supposed to be much weaker, and we're essentially uh, no superconductivity on the whole dope side where all the high TCs are. Yes? Just a quick question to clarify. Is, are you showing like some superconducting or some susceptibilities? Yeah, these are all just measures of uh, local order um, in, uh, you know, a certain assumptions, you know, that it, it's, so it's a very rough connection between these, you know, temperature versus order there, they should be somewhat similar, okay? And um, so, so, so what's wrong? And for a long time, you know, it was just that our, our computational methods were not good enough. And, and often when one would uh, look at a result of a calculation, you were really seeing the approximations that went into the calculation because these are very difficult systems. That, I think, has really changed. And so we're now, now we sort of know what we're simulating, but we don't have the right model, okay? And so we put in um, this extra term T prime because it's, you know, sort of the second simpl simplest besides what we already had. And it's very important. And there's potentially a lot of other small terms of the sort of, you know, coefficients of sort of the, the order of 10% of the big coefficients that we don't know very well. 
and they seem to make a very big difference to the phase diagram, and we don't know what those are, and we would love to be able to derive them sort of more directly from electronic structure. So Garnet um, took the approach of, you know, we're just going to try to use the, 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 the best uh, simulation techniques and, you know, power through to do them with, you know, all the electrons or most of the electrons in it and not go through the models, okay? And uh, my approach is more, okay, we're still trying to go through the models, but we would like to have some, you know, better way to derive what, what the parameters and what, what extra terms we might put into the model are, okay? And so that's sort of driven me to uh, want to, uh, you know, improve the techniques for um, applying the strongly correlated methods directly um, uh, for the uh, uh, systems with the realistic chemistry of the, all the electrons. Yeah. This is a ground state? Yes. And uh, in, is that possible to use some purified things to study the final temperature effects using? Yes. Electron? Yes. Um, so we have some good techniques. Um, my favorite I developed called METS, which um, is there's, we had, you know, we're, we're sort of just a little bit behind in sort of the widths that we can do um, in applying the finite temperature techniques. That's just now coming in to its own. Yeah, so, but we, but, you know, again, it's a little bit, you know, when, when you sort of put in a little bit of extra realism, um, it makes the calculation more difficult. The overall effect on the difficulty of the calculation is the width of the system. DMRG is very good in one dimension, doesn't care how long it is but it goes exponentially bad in the width. But what that means is that if we do a fancier technique, say, to get temperature, well, if we reduce the width by a factor of one-half, then we can, we can do it. Um, we sort of regain the power. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so now I'll give my outline. Um, so I want to talk, uh, so, so uh, you know, the, the, so, so using DMRG in quantum chemistry is now an established uh, robust community, lots of things going on. But, um, uh, you know, the, I, I feel that there are weaknesses in the setup of the Hamiltonians that uh, um, are used for that, uh, traced back to the Gaussian, uh, uh, standard Gaussian basis sets for quantum chemistry. So I want to talk a little bit about this setup and the weaknesses of using Gaussians, and then talk about how we've uh, tried to um, uh, improve the situation with various ways of getting much more local functions. So I'll talk about slice basis sets and um, then connecting to the topic of um, the, the conference, I'll talk about um, uh, using this to derive some effective models. What we'd really like to do in a more general situation, this is in a more, an easier system, it's just hydrogen chains, but we derive effective Hubbard models using the slice basis DMRG. Okay, and so I'll say a little bit about that and then talk about um, the sort of uh, next stage of developing um, these local basis sets. Okay, and um, I have a fair number of uh, collaborators in this. Uh, uh, in particular, let, let me highlight uh, Miles and Yihang for the Gauss-Lick work. Okay, <clears throat> so let me say a little bit uh, just for those of you who are not so familiar uh, with uh, DMRG and matrix product states, which are related to tensor trains. Okay, so let's just think about um, how you can compress uh, a matrix. Uh, and one of the standard ways to compress a matrix is that if it has low rank, which basically means that if you do a singular value decomposition on the matrix, there's only a small number of significant non-zero um, singular values. So just uh, drawing the matrices as little rectangles, you have some sort of square matrix. You do the singular value factorization, the U, D, V transpose. You, the, the center matrix is diagonal, the singular values sit there. If only a few of them are significant and they're sorted, then you get to factor your matrix in this sort of nice little way. Okay, so how do you apply that to a wave function? So if you have a wave function which is uh, either a wave function of spins or electrons in Fox space in a basis, um, you can write the wave function just in this sort of, you know, many uh, index uh, form where uh, each S, say, has two values of, or four values. 
We can always uh, just group these spins together to reform it as a matrix. There's no real content difference here, but we can make a matrix like this with some arbitrary division between the, the, the groups of, of, of sites you put together. Then we do an SVD on this. Okay, so um, uh, you, the von Neumann entanglement entropy is defined with respect to the singular values of this SVD. So if they're uh, lambda, then um, the, uh, 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 singular, the, the von Neumann entanglement entropy is given by the standard entropy formula where the lambda squares uh, act, play the role of probability. Okay, so, so small uh, entropy means that the wave function is compressible in this way. And um, there's something which is called the area law, which, you know, it, law means it's sort of a conjecture that people work on proving, and there's some, some proofs for this in certain cases. Um, Hastings is the person who's, you know, done some of the most notable work in proving this in one dimension, say. Um, but the, the area law says that for the most for most sensible Hamiltonians, meaning that they have local, a local number of, of terms in terms of what sites they live on, um, the entanglement entropy for the ground state, as you make a system bigger, grows with the area of the cut between the two sides rather than either volume. So in other words, you, you cut a system, you have a block and you cut it in two, and the entanglement entropy will be proportional to the area of that rather than the volume. And if you con contrast that to highly excited states, then it's a volume law, which is much worse, okay? And so this um, area law is enough to uh, enable uh, very nice approximations. So if you, if you don't just do one arbitrary cut, but you make a sequence of cuts in between every Every, set, every, every link on this set of sites in some order, then you get a matrix product state, and it's a very strong compression and exponential compression of the wave function, where you just have a set of matrices that you work with. And uh, this has been sort of reinvented um, as a tensor train. And uh, so this is the framework for, for DMRG. It's also closely related to a broader field of tensor networks. Uh, so DMRG is just sort of a simple, uh, the, the simplest uh, example of a, a tensor network. And this uh, area law is the reason that DMRG uh, works, works very well. So in practice, is uh, the von Neumann entropy sum terminated at L or at some appropriate level such that S is small enough? Yeah, so, so in practice, um, you, you, you have to do something self-consistent to get some estimate of this. In principle, if you had a, a small system and um, you, you could diagonalize for every eigenstate, then you can calculate it exactly. And, um, and then you would find that you could, can do the truncation. Okay, but how do you get a, a wave function for a big system? Well, you have to build it up self-consistently. So you sort of like make some approximation to get started and um, you know, do a truncation based on what you have, which is imperfect, and then slowly iterate it and improve it. And so the DMRG sweeping algorithm is the method that um, is very effective at finding ground states in that sort of constrained way. Okay. So um, quantum chemistry uh, DMRG, um, so, uh, I had some background in working in, in quantum chemistry from my uh, thesis days. Uh, I was a student with Ken Wilson, and he was um, mostly a particle physicist and did the renormalization group, but he was also very interested in quantum chemistry because his dad was E. Bright Wilson, a famous chemist at Harvard. So uh, I, was, I sort of worked on this. And, um, uh, and so, that, that, so when DMRG came along, I was interested pretty uh, quickly in trying to apply it to uh, quantum chemistry. So the technical issue is um, that the uh, two electron interaction in a basis has this, you know, very familiar form with this uh, four indices on the interaction thing. Okay, so there are some tricks that you can do to sort of reduce the computational scaling so it's not quite as bad as you think, but it's still much more difficult than um, uh, just, say, simulating the Hubbard model. 
So what we could do back in 99 was uh, we could do, uh, you know, uh, a Gaussian basis with 25 basis functions, uh, transform it to the hartree fock molecular orbital, apply conventional DMRG on this, and get uh, reasonable results for a stretched water molecule. The progress in two decades has been quite substantial. Um, a lot of it done, you know, driven by Garnet and his group. Um, and, um, but now you're still limited within this framework of, uh, say, 100 or, you know, a little bit more than that uh, active orbitals. And you can go a little bit farther by selecting just the active ones from a bigger Gaussian basis and use a, a more restrictive calculation. And, and, um, and of course, there are the uh, impurity type of uh, methods like DMET. Okay, but if you contrast what, what the pure DMRG of this is doing compared to Hubbard-like models, um, the, in Hubbard-like models, the calculation scales with the, the size n, or at least in a one-dimensional uh, situation as n. And um, here it would be going as there's a term with n cubed and another term that's smaller, usually that's n to the fourth. Okay, so with Hubbard-like models, we can do thousands of sites for a change. The issue is that the Gaussians are highly optimized to reduce the number, but not to simplify the form of the interaction. Okay, and they also don't necessarily try to reduce the entanglement. And that's, uh, so there are two issues here. One is trying to make the system obey the area law so DMRG has a good chance. And the other issue is computational scaling because of this sort of term versus a uh, term that, you, the, the, this, is, this would be the two electron interaction if you just did a very simple grid approximation. Okay, so what, so how do we think about this area law um, for a, a system defined with a basis set? Okay, so, so here's this sort of picture that we draw for the area law. Um, a and sometimes is the area and sometimes it's just the left side of the system, so try not to be confused. But here is, we, we, we have a, a chunk of the system. The area is just the, the sort of sites on the contact point, okay? The entanglement entropy is proportional to this area. And then the matrix size that we use in DMRG grows exponentially with that uh, uh, entropy, which looks bad, but it's not so big a coefficient and, and DMRG is very efficient. Okay, so what about when we now define this? This is real, the, 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 the way this is thought about is, is say a spin system. So what about in a, a basis? So um, the key to the area law is the locality. And if you write down uh, something in momentum space or molecular orbital space, there's no locality. So in terms of a, sort of a Feynman diagram, two K points can scatter two very distant K points and still conserve momentum. And so the, this sort of diagram showing the interaction shows that there's no locality. So you, if you do it in K-space, you go back to a volume law and you don't expect DMRG to work very well. Um, but there is an exception, which is um, that if you look at, say, suppose you just wanted to reproduce Hartree-Fock. If you choose the Hartree-Fock orbitals as the basis set, um, then it's a product state, a determinant is just a product state with no entropy, okay? And so, you, so DMRG works perfectly with your matrix size of one, okay? So you have this sort of case where it works perfectly with a, you know, sort of the extreme Hartree-Fock limit, but more generally, it, the, you need to have a local basis. So suppose we have a mostly localized basis, Okay, and, and you know, this is an area where we don't have any, any sort of rigorous things. There's, there's not even too many um, tests. But the sort of expectation would be that if the basis functions sort of pollute into the other area, that you should get a sort of limited volume law, but the width is only this sort of size of the basis functions. Okay, so that's what we, had, we would expect. And so we have, we have to, we have to worry about both this sort of issue on a bigger system, and then we might want to take advantage, say, for core orbitals, that we, we can sort of put the, go to the Hartree-Fock basis and then just take advantage of this sort of simple uh, uh, property for, uh, for Hartree-Fock or determinant states. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, uh, okay, so then, so now, what is the best basis to use with DMRG? What do we know? Okay, so again, it's the area law versus this 
Hartree-Fock determinant. Um, so an approach developed by Garnet's group is to localize separately within two uh, subspaces. Uh, you sort of draw a line and say these are the occupied states, and you try to localize with them, and all the rest are unoccupied, and this is a sort of arbitrary uh, you know, grouping of states, but you localize within each separately. Okay, and um, so that's uh, that sort of within that framework that does rather well. Alternatively, or Ursula Legesa has developed on the fly basis uh, rotations where you just sort of try to directly measure the entanglement and then do local rotations to try to optimize it. Okay, and that all, both of these have been, um, uh, you know, much better than, for example, just um, starting with the Hartree Fock orbitals. Okay. There's a the separate issue is, is this issue of the computational scaling. So any standard basis will give you the two electron integrals like this. If we somehow used a grid, it would use this diagonal representation. Okay. And so the question is, well, how well can a grid work? You know, one knows that the grids are not as efficient as basis functions. You need more grid points. But you have a big advantage here. It also not, you know, maximally exploits one end of the entanglement issue. It keeps everything as local as possible. Okay, so, so the question is, what can you do with a grid? Okay, so, so we've had, you know, a, a, a set of different uh, sort of projects in this area. And the first thing you can do is uh, just consider one-dimensional systems. Of course, we've been doing, you know, you might do one-dimensional Hubbard change, but we want to consider continuum systems. You know, which we might put in a 1D basis, or we can put in a 1D grid. And with longer range interactions, and the interested in this, this is a sort of long running collaboration between Kieran Burke and I, um, where we're sort of like, okay, how do we really understand the, you know, foundations of density functional theory? You know, it's very helpful to have exact um, ground states in a very flexible way um, to compare with DFT, okay? So, so we developed a, a set of um, sort of a, a laboratory of um, sort of pseudo atoms and molecules, which are designed to mimic a little bit the 3D reality, but they're still just sort of one, one dimensional toy models with say, for instance, the soft Coulomb interaction between them or exponential interactions. We put them just on a very simple grid with a finite difference approximation um, and just write down this simplified Vij form of the two electron interactions. Okay, but then we use some uh, modern tensor network technology, the sort of, uh, there's something called a matrix product operator related to a matrix product state that we can compress in a certain way. And what this actually gives you is um, a scaling, even though the number, you know, there's still the, the, the time, you know, the, the, well, you don't even have to write down this, this uh, thing if it's translation invariant, but you get a linear scaling in um, this system. And, um, uh, and so this, this approach, you know, once you sort of resolve some of these problems, it really works well. So, so you can do up to, say, 100 pseudoatoms without, you know, so much trouble on a desktop. That translates to about 4,000 4, grid points. The results are, in terms of correlation are essentially exact. And so here's an example we had. Um, uh, a number of years ago um, that was comparing the exact, exact results for a sort of long chain of these pseudo-hydrogen atoms. Um, we had the exact um, uh, uh, density oscillation uh, from DMRG. Then we could uh, compare that with the sort of one-dimensional versions of uh, uh, local density uh, functional theory. Yeah? Is the... Big N used here for the two index Coulomb operator, the same big N used from the four index Coulomb operator? Yes. So if you, if you were doing this separately in a basis, then the N would uh, not be the, it's the same in principle in terms of formalism, okay, but in terms of a given accuracy, it's always better to go to a basis set, right? And so what, what is the penalty that we're paying here? You know, here we have about 40 grid points per atom. And so maybe, you know, you have on the order of, say, five basis functions. Uh, and so you, ha you have this penalty, you know, of maybe a, an order of magnitude in the number, in, in the N in terms of the accuracy of the, rep equivalent accuracy of the rep 
representation. And that's, that's something that we're always dealing with. Um, when we do these localized bases, they're, they're not quite, you know, the, the sort of, you know, non-local basis sets are just optimally efficient in some ways. Okay, so, so this, you know, in, in terms of, calc you know, efficient calculations for, for these sorts of problems, this is really, you know, an ideal method. You know, sometimes we would uh, have trouble converging the DFT and it would be slower than the DMRG for these big systems. Um, okay, so, so now we want to go to try to do um, steps into three dimensions. Um, and so if you think of a naive grid in, uh, directly in 3D with this sort of 40 per atom, you know, uh, 40, 40 grid points in each direction, qubit, you know, you quickly get into the millions of grid points, which is uh, sort of prohibitive. But another thing you can do is you can lay down a grid in one direction. Now, now what does that give you? If you think of the area law where we're sort of slicing the system with planes, well, if we do the grid in the other direction, we don't get any of this volume law thing. The grid is very narrow. The basis functions are, you know, very completely localized in that direction. So it potentially it helps a lot with the entanglement. Because the grid also limits the uh, number, uh, it, it induces a sparsity of the two electron interaction. Because if two points don't touch, they can't give you a VIJKL. And um, so you get uh, sort of non-sparsity within the sort of slice that you're doing. Uh, but you get uh, sparsity the other way. So, so the idea is that for the transverse directions, we just use Gaussians from a standard um, basis set, and we sort of slice them. We sort of project onto the plane. Okay, so this is slice basis DMRG. Um, so for instance, the, the transverse S functions that we would put on a, a grid point, you know, you orthonormalize them, and, and here's an example of just the S functions, and then we have some, some P's and stuff. Okay. Um, so... How does this do? Um, so the technology is, um, once you sort of set, set up the Hamiltonian, the DMRG technology is not so different from, you know, the, the last grid. Um, so the, the, on each slice, and this is an example where you'd had sort of three Gaussians per slice. And so that, that looks sort of like a, a ladder um, calculation for DMRG. Uh, you sort of go up along here. You sort of have this snake path that goes through the system. We're, we're used to doing that um, to try to do 2D systems. Okay, so from the DMRG point of view, it's it's very simple. Um, there's it has uh, you have some you know you have limited sparseness, um, uh, but you can do, still do some of the compression. Okay, and so but this is something that we can apply to an interesting. 3D system, which is, you know, hydrogen chains. So it's still, of course, the, the atoms are arranged in one dimension, and that helps the DMRG, but, um, you know, you're still doing 3D orbitals. Okay, so the, an interesting... How, how come the green line is 6G? How come it's greater than half? Uh, which one are, which are you looking at? On the right graph. Oh, okay, I'll get to this in just a second. Yeah, let me... Do this first. Um, okay, so uh, it, it, so one extreme limit is if you do a minimal basis, so just one function per slice, um, then you get this linear scaling. And so this is sort of example. This is the calculation time for one DMRG sweep. So maybe you need ten of these, and um, this is in seconds. And so this is this for. 1,000 hydrogen atoms in this minimal basis, we're talking about an hour of computer time on one node. So it's um, very efficient. Okay, it's, uh, so then when you try to go beyond a minimal basis, the scaling isn't as good. Um, so in this uh, set of calculations here, we went up to the triple basis set, and this is just 10 hydrogen atoms, so you wouldn't be able to do as long a system with uh, the, the, the more complete basis sets. This was where we could compare with conventional quantum chemistry DMRG. Okay, so, uh, so as Roy was just asking, you know, we have, we have the green lines here that are... Um, so, so what's going on with this is, is 
we sort of have perfect correlation from our grid, so that's not feeling the basis set. But this freezing process is, um, it also restricts it a little bit. Um, it's a little bit non-trivial. You're sort of like projecting out in some way. And when you have two atoms, you have to decide how to project it. And so it's, it's not, not quite something that, that's trivial. And so we tend, the, the main limitation in the completeness for these curves, this is just the, the total energy of the system per atom as a function of the separation of the hydrogen chains for a, this 10 atom system. Okay, and it closely tracks um, the results of a standard quantum chemistry DMRG. Okay, for the equivalent basis, but um, there, it's some, you know, alternation which one's lower in the, in the, the um, uh, simplest basis, but in the uh, double zeta and triple zeta, um, usually the perfect correlation in one direction pushes the, the slice basis a little bit lower. Okay, so, um, so how does this compare to sort of state of the art? Well, if you look at this 10 atom system and you say, what can quantum chemistry DMRG do? This is the limit, you know, that's, uh, uh, you can't do the next order. So we can sort of match the limit in this sort of uh, uh, context with, I think, you know, somewhat less computer time. And um, it's fairly easy for us to just make this longer. You know, there's that, you know, for 20 hydrogen atoms, it's twice the computer time, roughly. Okay, okay so, so now I want to switch gears to an application of this, but to, uh, well, not a direct application, but to try to, re to think about the issue of model reduction to, um, to things like Hubbard models. Okay, and so this is work done with my, my former student, Randy Sawaya. And the idea, so if you think of a hydrogen chain, um, you know, mostly there's one electron per atom, but it can fluctuate to two electrons per atom. It really is sort of a setup for a Hubbard model. You know, the main difference between a sort of Hubbard model is, you know, the hydrogen chain has virtual orbitals that can go into, um, you know, more things can go on. But if you wanted to go to a simple model, you might think of a Hubbard-like model, except that there's the issue of what about the long-range Coulomb repulsion between different atoms? You know, how can we truncate that down just to a local term? Okay, so that's what we're trying to uh, address in, in, in this uh, study, which was, uh, you know, just uh, published uh, this year. Okay, uh, so, so how do we go? So what we want to try to do is, is sort of redo the typical way that one's, one derives Hubbard models from realistic systems, but redo it assuming that we have the full accuracy of the slice basis DMRG. And so not, we don't have to make all the usual approximations. I mean, another way to put it is that, um, you know, density functional theory doesn't really work very well for the hydrogen chains. So why would you use that to make a model? You know, it, it, but, but then the point, the, the argument that you have to make is that, oh yeah, but the parts where it doesn't work aren't the parts that go into the model, you know. But that, that's the sort of thing that we want to test. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, how, does, how does this work? Okay. Um, so, first of all, we want to go to Wannier functions. Now, the, the typical Wannier functions are described in terms of a band from, from say, DFT over Hartree-Fock. And um, instead, we can do a little bit better because we have this uh, very accurate solution, and we can get the natural orbitals of uh, the system. And we can truncate those and use those to make uh, the Wannier functions. So here are the occupancies of the natural orbitals for a, a 20 um, atom system. And um, you know, if, Hartree, if you were doing the Hartree-Fock approximation, you would doubly occupy 10 orbitals, and so this would be like a step function, okay? Um, but because it's interacting, um, the uh, sort of Fermi surface gets smeared out, and it's smeared out more with a larger stretch, okay? Uh, this is, you know, uh, spacing of 3.2 bohr, okay? Uh, but then what's interesting is if you look at the natural orbital occupancy, once you get to twice the minimal number, it falls off significantly, okay? And when you do Wannier functions, 
Um, you, this is the natural number to use. We want to put one Wannier function per atom, not, you know, every other atom. Okay, so we can truncate here, and then the um, occupancy of the higher ones are, is really quite small. So it's a very good approximation to just throw away these um, natural orbitals. Okay, that's sort of an occupancy of around 10 to the minus 3. Okay, another thing you can do, by the way, I should just mention, is that you don't have to produce your natural orbitals just from the ground state. You could average the reduced density matrix from several different states, which would make your re resulting Hamiltonian better able to represent excited states. Okay, defining the Wannier functions. So, um, you know, there are sophisticated techniques for doing this, a maximally localized Wannier function sorts of things. Um, in one dimension, this is, there's a very simple method that, that uh, you know, sort of equivalently good. And uh, what you do is you just go to this, uh, say, tw space of 20 functions and diagonalize the Z coordinate, which is just our grid. You diagonalize the Z coordinate matrix, and it, just like a diagonalizing a Hamiltonian localizes you in energy, if you diagonalize the Z coordinate, you localize in Z. And it naturally gives you these Wannier functions, and this is pretty well known. Okay. And so we get these Wannier functions. So here's an example of one of the Wannier functions that we get. Here's the sort of a transverse slice of the functions, and here it is along the chain direction. Well, then we can compare it with uh, what you would do if you just tried to do a simple thing based on Hartree-Fock. You know, do we get very different Wannier functions or, or are they very similar? Okay. And they turn out to be very similar. Okay, so this is encouraging for the sort of conventional approaches of model reduction. At least qualitatively, they're very similar. You see small differences, you know, so in terms of quantitative accuracy, we wouldn't expect Hartree-Fock to be quite as good, but it's... Um, you know, very similar. Uh, yeah. Last question. So when you say you, you do that in R2FOC, in R2FOC you just said that the occupancies are zero, though, and at once and Yeah, yeah. So you, you, can, just... you can just uh, use the eigenvectors of the FOC matrix okay. up to a cutoff. Up to n, like, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then, then we can do the, the integrals to define um, uh, interaction parameters. Um, and you get fairly short range hoppings, but to, for accuracy, you know, you, you make them go out a little ways. It's just where these different Wannier functions touch. For the Coulomb integrals, um, so we, we, didn't, we didn't feel that we needed to try to do anything sophisticated with screening, no uh, RPA or anything. Um, the justification was that the very low occupancy of these other orbitals in this particular system um, says that they can't do much screening. You know, if they were screening, they would, it would be there in the DMRG, it would show up in their occupancy, they'd have more occupancy. Uh, so we just tried, you know, sort of a, using the Coulomb integrals, and then we could verify that that was working by simulating that model and comparing it back to the original, you know, much more exact slice basis result, and, and it was a good approximation, okay. Uh, next, we want to, so the integrals that you get um, just by doing the integrals are four index integrals, but uh, a reduction to a model, we, first step is we want just a VIJ form. Um, and so we try just a simple uh, truncation to this. And we were prepared to try some fancier things, but this turned out to be quite good also. The, off-diagonal terms just naturally turn out to be very small in this system, and you can just truncate them, and again, sort of check to see how it works. Okay, so what you end up with that, if, if, you, if you do that, is an, um, an extended Hubbard model with some longer range hopping um, and some diagonal Coulomb interaction with, you know, one Wannier function per atom. That's still not the Hubbard model where, say, maybe you only have the on-site Coulomb repulsion, okay? So how do we do this sort of stronger model reduction, okay? And um, first of all, you want to try to go to a model where it's a natural model, and so the Hubbard model is a natural model, uh, or it's not going to make much sense. Um, if, you, if, if you sort of talk to a, you know, your typical condensed matter theorist, the systems we're looking at have a, a gap 
a charge excitation gap. And so the sense is that this long range part of the Coulomb interaction isn't so important. But how do you remove it quantitatively? OK, so there is a neat approach to um, sort of uh, model reduction, which says let's define the suitability of an effective Hamiltonian only in terms of the states it produces. So we say, OK, here is the ground state, and we parameterize the ground state by parameterizing this effective Hamiltonian. OK. Then you say, OK, so I want good ground states. So I evaluate the expectation value of this funny ground state produced by the effective Hamiltonian in the full Hamiltonian. And you try to minimize that. OK, so now if you, if you took the effective Hamiltonian and you scaled it by some unit, some parameter, that wouldn't change anything at all. You know? So it, it doesn't fill in all the details of the effective Hamiltonian. But once you have minimized this, then you can set the overall constant and scale. OK, this assumes that your, your effective Hamiltonian and your full Hamiltonian live in the same space, you know, which is just our sort of one eight orbitals in this case. So we, and um, if they don't live in the full space, you need to have a mapping between these. Okay, and uh, Lucas Wagner um, at uh, Illinois is, uh, has been working on this sort of thing. And this is where we learned about this technique. But it, it dates back. I don't know if this is the earliest uh, uh, reference for this sort of technique. So I think it's a, it's a pretty nice technique that sort of you know, avoids the, just sort of skips over the many, you know, the three body terms, et cetera, from a similarity transformation. It tries to just do a shortcut. OK, so we implement this. And first question is, can we reduce all the way to a local Hubbard model with local t and local u? And so the deviation of this energy from the full, full energy, we call delta E. And so we see that we're not doing too badly. This point in this uh, 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 surface is the pure Hubbard model. And you know, it's, it's sort of not too bad in terms of uh, total energy. And you can also look at sort of overlaps with the uh, wave functions. And it's, it's uh, not too bad. But if you want to do it more quantitatively, you want to include some longer range hoppings and some longer range Coulomb interaction. But you certainly do not have to have the Coulomb interaction go all the way across the system. So this uh, excellent fit here is with a Coulomb interaction that goes out three sites. And, and that, if you go, try to go to, in this direction, you get the biggest reduction by increasing the range of the Coulomb interaction. Okay, and then get a little bit farther by increasing the range of hopping. Now, the form of the Coulomb interaction that you get, you know, this assumes that you, you really optimize it and you've got the best parameters. And these, these curves here show the form of the Coulomb interaction as you go site, site by site away. Okay, and um, so they're with different cutoffs in the range. So the Hubbard, pure Hubbard term is sitting here you know, at 1.2 something. If you allow the interaction to go out two sites, it doesn't choose the same local Hubbard parameter at all. And it tries to make something that like goes smoothly to zero. That's what reproduces the best ground state. So it's something that you, in retrospect, you, you, you probably would have thought of. Um, you know, the, why, why should you change the local Hubbard parameter? Well. The electrons can't really get too far away from each other. So you don't want to compare electrons being together or infinity. It's a crowded system. So you know, at most, they might get a little bit away. And so what matters more, you can see that this distance between the, the u and the next term is a little bit more constant. You know, and it, it's, uh, so it's, you can, if you think about this, it's sort of a reasonable sort of uh, behavior. OK. Um, and final checks, which I, I don't show, is um, you can then feed these models back into a bigger system, you know, translate the parameters to a long system. You can do the big Hubbard model, look at um, long range correlations and some of the things that we're interested in and see that it works, uh, works quite well. 
this yeah. is <coughs> excuse me. So this is essentially a wave function ensemble parameterized by this. Uh, yes. Right. Yes, by the Hamiltonian. Uh, by the Hamiltonian. Yeah. How easy is it to optimize? It sounds like nightmare. Oh well, we don't have so many parameters in our Hamiltonian, and um, so in fact, it's not too hard. You know, I mean, in terms of, uh, let's see. So one of the, uh, let's see. So so this is generally in a smaller space with a simpler Hamiltonian. So the, in this case, the DMRG is pretty cheap. That part is not. And then then you have the full Hamiltonian to for one evaluation of the energy. So more terms, but it's one evaluation. Okay, so it turns out it's not too bad, at least in this context. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's all I wanted to say about uh, the, the model reduction. We're running a little bit out of time, but let me try to give you a little sense of um, what we're trying to do for fully three-dimensional localized uh, basis sets. Okay, uh, and so this just talks about some of the ways you might try to sort of truly bring this to 3D. Um, we ended, you know, there's things that we didn't see how they would work so well. Maybe we just weren't clever enough, but um, looking at wavelets turns out to be a nice way to do it. So let me just try to, since there's little time, let me just try to give you an idea of what what um, this sort of special function that we developed called a gausslet is. Okay, so a gausslet, so what, what you, so the, the compressed Hamiltonian really was something associated with a grid. But basis functions have some key advantages to them. Um, for example, a key advantage of a basis function is that if you want to add a singular function, a core function, you, you know how to do that. You can just orthogonalize it to your, your other functions and add it. And mixing grids, literal grids, and specialized functions is not, not so easy. At least I don't know how to do it. So it's very useful to have a basis representation, but we would like it to, to somehow be more of a grid-based function. Okay, so here's um, this uh, gausslet. It's sort of a universal function up for a particular order. Um, it lives in a, a, a uniform array, until you distort it at least. So here's other gausslets. Each of them is orthogonal. They have really excellent completeness. Um, so in other words, they, they um, have a nearly exact fit to any polynomial up to um, a particular order, in this case, 10th uh, order. Orthonormal, you're trying to get a minimal with uncertainty in X and P, which is, of course, a Gaussian, except that you're imposing orthogonality. And that, that, that turns out to be a very significant complication to try to optimize X and P locality with orthogonality thrown in. And that was really only sort of solved in a satisfactory way with the development of wavelets. Okay. So this is like the scaling function in um, a, a wavelet multi-resolution basis. Um, and it's closely related to that. These, um, one thing that you rarely see with wavelets is um, symmetric wavelets, when, which are also well localized. And that was a sort of uh, extra ingredient that we developed. Um, and the, the, but the most important thing about these functions is that they integrate like a delta function for polynomials. So um, if you multiply one of these gausslets by a polynomial, you get this delta n0 um, up to uh, a pretty high order, like 20 or so. Okay. Now, it turns out that this delta function property is enough to give you the diagonal uh, approximation. So you get the vijkl goes to vij um, um, sort of automatically from these set of properties. And this one is usually not a property of a wavelet. There's a few wavelets that uh, the, the, coi the coiflets were engineered to have this property. Um, these are a little bit of an improvement on the coiflets. Okay. Um, let, let me mention one other property of the, the Gauss. So, so wavelets can be a little bit difficult to work with in terms of the numerical analysis of integrating them. 
Usually you sort of have to bring in an expert to tell you how to do the tricks associated with wavelets. But Gauss-Lits, this is a formula for a Gauss-Lit. It's defined on a subarray of one-third spacing of pure Gaussians, uniform Gaussians. So for instance, um, a few of the Gaussians that add up to make the Gauss-Lit are shown here multiplied by their, their coefficient. Okay, so this is the formula, the exact formula defining a Gauss-Lit, and all you need to know is um, these coefficients bj, which you, know, you can look up in our paper or I can email them to you. And so it's an analytic form, which usually you don't have for a wavelet scaling function because they're defined in terms of a fixed point of a wavelet transform, and, and they can be kind of fractal, or at least fractal in high derivatives. This is just a sum of Gaussian, so it's completely smooth, okay? Um, and uh, so that was sort of the, the, so this was just tried to engineer them so that they're convenient for electronic structure. You know, you want to do any integrals? They're with Gaussians in some sense. If you want to do numerical integrals, they're extremely smooth. Okay, so to learn more about some of this, um, these were the, the wavelets that we used to start this were developed by Glenn Evanby and I, and he gave an IPAM talk uh, from a, a few months ago where he talked about these. And, and the application to these is that um, these wavelets that form the basis for the Gauss-Lits, you know, in some sense are just better than previous wavelets. Um, they used to better give better image compression um, than standard uh, JPEG wavelet sets by like 7%, which could be a big deal if you, you know, are changing how internet sends movies back and forth. Okay, so um, anyway, Glenn's talk is very interesting. Okay, so uh, I'm essentially out of time, but we have these neat functions which um, give us the diagonal approximation, and um, you know, this is tests of the diagonal approximation where you see the diagonal approximation and just solving a one-dimensional potential, you know, you can put in the standard approach to, a Hamil to an interaction matrix or you can do the diagonal approximation, but they have very rapid convergence to the correct value, okay? And you can add singular functions on top of them to, again, get this very nice convergence. So the idea is add standard Gaussian basis sets um, to, uh, uh, to these Gauss-Lits to represent the core, okay? And um, some further details, uh, you, do, you can distort them, remap them so that, you know, the nucleus is here and they um, have a big spacing far away um, and uh, have better resolution at the core and put them in 3D. And um, I guess I'll make this sort of the, the last slide we, we, we can use this in things, we've done tests up to say about H10 with these sort of a three-dimensional grid of, of Gauss-Lits. This is the convergence of the DMRG. It, um, and we're comparing with what you get with a conventional uh, approach with various levels of the basis set. And we get a very nicely converging DMRG and pretty easy calculation um, that uh, goes below say five zeta. Uh, in terms of convergence. And here's, um, you know, from a benchmark study of um, hydrogen chain results with a variety of different methods. And um, the uh, Gauss-Lits are doing uh, as good, as, better than all the standard methods. Um, the reference here is one particular quantum Monte Carlo result, which turns out to be extremely accurate because it agrees so well with with the Gauss-Lits, okay. So, uh, um, uh, so anyway, that's a little bit of a flavor and uh, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, okay, and there's some interesting things about uh, correcting for the cusp when you have a local basis. Okay, let me go, just go to the conclusions. Okay, so the, a big message is that how you set up the Hamiltonian has a big influence on DMRG calculations. What you might think you know about what DMRG is useful for is not necessarily true. It's not necessarily just good for static correlation. Um, slice bases offer some substantial advantages over Gaussians um, for systems like the hydrogen chain, okay? We went over 
how you can do model reduction with this. And then we have this sort of uh, newer approach, Gauss-Litz, um, which give you efficiency and a number of different advantages. And uh, these are still much in development. Okay, um, thanks. <laughs>